Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital assets. I'm Michael Casey, filling in this week for Christine Lee. And joining me are my co-hosts, Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Lewerton, and Emily Mark Parker, Managing Director of International Content. Hi, guys. Hey. Hello. Hello. Um, today, looking at the date, it's January 6th, like one of those one of those date days, right? I mean, not, not, a, not, yeah, a, still not a positive, not a happy Jan- one, of course. Still, yeah, still writing January 5th on my checks. But that's, right, uh, that's, that's maybe a better yeah. idea. Uh, but yeah, it is. It's sort of one of those dates that's going to like last with us in history, presumably, like, like 9-11. But um, Emily, what's, uh, what's going on in your world? What are you, what are you interested in, in what's happening in the crypto world at the moment? So basically, I think everyone in the crypto world is kind of in the same world right now, which is that the market has crashed. Um, but one of the things that I find very interesting is if you look at the price charts, it's kind of a sea of red. And I just think this is a very interesting topic for the industry in general, that we have all the alts, at least on the short term, moving in tandem with Bitcoin. And we can get into that in more detail with our market guests. because I know the longer term narrative is a little different, but at least as of today, we're facing a sea of red. Right. And, and of course, Bitcoin getting knocked uh, uh, at the starting point of this yesterday. A couple of factors in play, though, Lawrence. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just I, you just cut out there. But, uh, you know, I'll just say that, yeah, January 6th is going to be a, a, a day that that's going to be an infamy uh, 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 as far as Bitcoin is concerned. But of course, the, the very myopic. Um, the we, we see. Um, you know, we, we saw this sell-off uh, triggered by the, the Fed basically saying that it's going to reduce its... Remember, there's a global story going on, and that is Kazakhstan is also part of this. I mean, we have Russian troops about to go into Kazakhstan, which if you are into crypto, you know that Kazakhstan's now picking up some of this, was picking up some of the slack from when the miners left China. And part of all this has to do with energy prices and with the, the, the writing, the, the real insurrection that we're seeing right now uh, on January 6th, no less, uh, uh, relates to energy prices, uh, natural gas prices going up in the country. People saying they're fed up with it. They can't take it anymore. They can't take the government anymore. And they're rioting. And now we have Russian troops coming in. And it's creating a, 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 a you know, this is, Kazakhstan is no small joke. I mean, this is a big country with a lot of natural resources and a lot of Bitcoin miners going on there. And to say that, you know, crypto miners are looking at this and they're like, gee, you know, I don't know. This, this is really a risky situation to be in right now. Do I really want to hold on to this? So I, I think we're seeing that a lot in the prices. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to talk through that with our, our guest today. All right, so let's take a look at uh, Bitcoin. The CoinX Indices Bitcoin price index, XBX, is at 43,102. And as you can see, as we were alluding to, down heavily from the previous day. Uh, the CoinX Ether price index, ETX, is at 3,400. Down, and ETH is down even more at 10 point, uh, almost 9% there. Uh, and of course, the DeFi index, the CoinX Indices DeFi, DFX index, is at 452.99. 13.10%, so to Emily's point about the alts and the sort of non-Bitcoin tokens getting hit, this is a, a really important point here. So, The Crypto Markets Update is brought to you by KuCoin, the best place to find the next crypto gem. So markets might be in the red for the start of 22, but 2021 was a very different story for crypto. Uh, And we have a chance now to reflect on the year that was via Coindesk's research annual report, which analyzes the performance and trends for digital assets in 2021 and their implications for 2022. This comprehensive report focuses on Bitcoin, Ethereum, DeFi, NFTs, and more. Research analyst George Kaloudis is here with the highlights and the lowlights. Welcome, George. How's it going, guys? Good morning. Good to see you, man. Hi. So, first of all, like, yeah, we'll, we'll get into sort of how this all is playing out with uh, the current moment. But, um, you know, one of the themes that, that seems to be pretty important is this, um, you know, Bitcoin dominance has declined. The idea that Bitcoin just rules the market uh, with the rise of, of, of relative to it, at least, Ethereum, but some other alts as well. Can you talk through what's going on there? Yeah. We I mean, if you just... Yeah, if you just look at any 2021 annual chart for any crypto project, you'll see that it has gone pretty much parabolic, right? So pretty much everything's up. So the fact that dominance of Bitcoin's market cap fell in relation to 
the rest of the crypto market cap is really unsurprising. And what we show here in this chart on the right is that in 2017, we had about 38% of the market cap was dominated by Bitcoin. In 2021, we're kind of approaching that now with that 40%. The thing that I would say is that we are in a very much of a different crypto market. The 2017 crypto market was decentralizing spaceships, airplanes. It was clearly vaporware and clearly scams. And now, although there are scams in, in the marketplace, it's very much more of a real industry where people are making genuine efforts to build projects up. So it's definitely a different world that we're working in now. So, George, I just want to kind of dig in a little bit to some of the super performers of 2021. And the two that really stand out are Polygon and Solana. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, just just what happened there and just what I mean, because for both of those, I mean, both of them are the, the two of them are quite different from one another, but they're not the only ones in that space. Right. So what made those two tokens stand out and perform so phenomenally in 2021? Yeah. If I know anything about crypto market investors, there's probably some weird nuance thing where, oh, they're both purple. We like purple. Purple coins are going to go up. Um, but there is kind of a thread that does tie them together is that it's about scaling. They're both about scaling. So Solana is one of one of the darlings of the year and is backed uh, pretty uh, strongly by Sam Bankman fried of FTX and from the people at Multicoin. So there's, that's a lot of money that was poured into Solana. But the reason Solana got so popular is because Ethereum gas fees were so high that it was difficult to carry out transactions on Ethereum. So people started looking for cheaper alternatives. And Solana offered a smart contract platform that was cheaper, right? People were saying, oh, this is free gas. This is for to even put a transaction in. Um, similarly, Polygon or Matish, the Polygon's the uh, rebrand, they are also building out three different scaling solutions for Ethereum. They're trying to do optimistic rollups, uh, ZK rollups, and they're working on a side chain. So it's really an Ethereum scaling solution with a token. So things that are tying these things together is the scaling problem of uh, smart contract platforms that are trying to be decentralized. The other thing I'd say, and the reason that it went up, you know, thirteen thousand or fourteen thousand percent is because they started at really small market caps, right? Solana now is around $50 billion and Polygon's at uh, $15 billion, I think. Uh, they did not start the year as such, right? These were tiny, tiny coins. And then suddenly the network effects kicked in. And we saw of crazy returns. I mean, crypto really outperformed traditional assets, but it came at a price. It came with a lot of volatility, correct? I mean, it, it, you know, one thing I noted in, in, in a previous column that I did was that if you just leveraged your... S&P 500 returns, you probably would have mirrored a lot of what Bitcoin would have done if you just leveraged it, let's say, 2x, you would have gotten the same returns in 2021. So can you, can you talk a little bit about what, what's additional assets? Yeah, Lawrence, I'll raise you one on that one. If you just held Apple stock last year, you probably would have just performed just as well if you held Bitcoin spot. So there is something to be said there about, you know, you could probably have made more money in the equity markets if, if you uh, only held Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, it, we are out, we outperformed last year. Bitcoin is up 60%. Ethereum is up 400%. But S&P still did rip. I mean, it was up 25% and gold and bonds are down. So we're clearly we're in, we're in what I would say is a, an environment where people are moving out on the risk curve, right? We've been talking about this for a really long time. And retail's injection into the markets, along with you know unprecedented economic stimulus and money printing, led to us to a period where everyone wants to take risk. So it's really not surprising to me that Bitcoin and Ethereum are up so much, and also the S and P. Um, you're getting a lot more volatility with Bitcoin and Ethereum and your favorite dog token, um, so that's the risk you take there. But yeah, with volatility and, comes know, returns. You know, along those lines, I mean, what, what you're saying about gold is that we, it did go down in 2021, and and there has been this narrative about inflation hedge, and yet you did see this extra risk taken on. So, so the whole narrative of Bitcoin being the inflation hedge, it didn't quite play out, correct? Yeah, I don't, I don't even know if Bitcoin knows what it wants to be because you have a, such a large, uh, such disparate subsets of groups who like Bitcoin for various reasons, right? A lot of people are saying it is the inflation, inflation hedge. A lot of people are saying it's gold 2.0. A lot of people are saying it's just going to destabilize the entire monetary system and it's going to spiral us into chaos. Other people are saying it's going to replace cash, right? And it's going to be sort of this parallel universe where we can, you know, pay with Bitcoin. I don't think Bitcoin's old enough to really know what it is. And I think calling it an inflation hedge now is premature. It's an aspirational store value in inflation hedge. How about that? 
That's good. But George, the story has gotten a lot wider than Bitcoin this past year, right? I mean, in, you know, largely Ethereum, but also based on these other Ethereum competitor blockchains, we've seen an explosion yeah. of, of different uh, use cases, NFTs, DeFi, et cetera. You know, what do, what do you make of that theme? Yeah, uh, I, I sort of uh, hinted at that when I answered Emily's question about Polygon and uh, Solana is that a lot of the new use cases that are coming up are new layer one con- uh, smart contract platforms, right? They're trying to scale these layer ones and make them cheaper and make them more affordable, make them more accessible. And really, that's powering the NFT boom that we've saw the past year. A lot of people heard about Ethereum because of NFTs, not the other way around. A lot of thing, people, things that people are building are also, you know, algorithmic stable coins. All those those projects are still pretty early. People are trying to build, you know, EVM bridges that bridge from one uh, chain to another chain, so we can have, you know, this internet of blockchains. Uh, but all that said, my favorite use case, and it's probably unsurprising to people who know who I am, is that Lightning. Right, the Lightning Network is what powers Bitcoin's commerce layer. And people are talking about how Bitcoin transaction fees are far too high to enable casual commerce. And I tend to agree. And so to that, people have built a second layer on top of uh, Bitcoin called the Lightning Network, which allows cheap instantaneous transactions. Uh, That's my favorite use case of the year. I think it's actually one of the somehow, I think because it's such a small country that uh, uh, Got, uh, sorry, I'm El losing Salvador. the word here, yep. but El Salvador, El thank Salvador. you. El Salvador. I couldn't think of the country. I can't believe that. El, <laughs> that's actually country. probably, that's exactly the point there, right? I forgot, and I spend all my, my time looking at this every day, is that Bitcoin became legal tender in a country, right? But it's El Salvador. It's a small country. I think it's a big deal. And, and clearly the people in the space think it's a big deal as well, because we saw the amount of Bitcoin locked up in the Lightning Network go from about 1,000 to 3,000 Bitcoin. And I think that was spurred on by El Salvador and by people who love Bitcoin trying to build out this use case. Uh, George, let's talk a little bit about hash rate. Um, so one of the huge stories of 2021 was China. Well, China's crackdown is kind of a continuous story, but China cracked down even more and they cracked down on mining pretty seriously. And so we basically saw hash rate migrate from China to other parts of the world, specifically the U.S. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the hash rate narrative of 2021? Yeah. So China's hit us with, I don't know, the fifth or sixth crypto ban, uh, widespread crypto ban in May of this year or of 2021, sorry, last year. And it was the first time where it felt real, right? We actually saw hash rate fall from about 150 exahashes to 90 over the period of like two or three weeks. Uh, and everyone was actually, there was a sort of a, a doomsday mentality from a lot of people that were saying that, oh my goodness, this is coming offline and Bitcoin's going to death spiral into zero. Uh, there were people that claimed that people were going to be moving miners from China over uh, to the West, right, to the US. And that was uh, fleshed out over, you know, the past couple of months because we recovered all of that ha- lost hash rate. We actually hit an all-time high by the end of the year at 189 exahashes. And all of the hash rate that was in China, presumably all, left. And it ended up going into the United States, into Russia, and into Kazakhstan. Uh, those are the three big places that it flew, uh, flowed into. So... Uh, getting back a little bit to what you were saying earlier about, uh, you know, you, you, you called the 2017, 2018, a, a period of scams, but in, in many ways, those ICOs that, that happened were a way for, for these projects to get funded. But what's interesting is this year, you're seeing a lot more funding happening, uh, from let's say VCs, private equity, et cetera. Uh, what does that tell us? What, what do we see? This was a lot of money, correct? Yeah, that's a lot of money. And the fact that we saw over $20 billion of VC capital flowing into these types of companies in 2021, that exceeded uh, 2017 through 2020 in totality. That's crazy. And we're seeing like real, I say real because you know how that uh, is viewed in this space, but real money flowed into the space, right? We have name brand venture capital firms, A16Z being sort of the, the stalwart of it pouring money into these projects because they want to make a return, but also because they think that it has staying power, right? Uh, you see regulators in the, in the Congress are talking about crypto. Crypto is here to stay. And now the fact that people have poured all this money, this VC money in, means that there's now an economic incentive, even more so than there was before, to, to carry this on going forward, right? At least in the medium term, right? Before it was, you know, 
retail investors are, were getting uh, screwed, right? They were losing all their money. Now it's big VC institutions with LPs that are insurance funds and or whatever they may be. So there's real money at stake now. Well, uh, so much for this uh, a brilliant 2021, uh, George. 2022 isn't looking quite so optimistic. Um, you know, and so let's just talk a little bit about that. Like I, 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 the Kazakhstan story to me is a really interesting one because one of the positive takeaways that people had from the way that the hash rate recovered from, you know, China's uh, departure and the, the, the exit of all the miners and seeking out these different locations was that we would have a more decentralized, less sort of geopolitically vulnerable Bitcoin network because you didn't have this big, you know, authoritarian state that could sort of, you know, pull the rug on everybody. Um, well, you know, yesterday we had a huge chunk, it looks like at least, of, of Kazakh's uh, mining capacity go down because of an internet outage that was driven by a political response to uh, a you know, the, the rioting and the insurrection there. Um, so can you speak to that? Like, you know, can we be as confident as we were a little while ago that we'd created a more decentralized Bitcoin network um, in 2021 with that sort of migration into the US and all those other locations out of China? Yeah. And to hedge against myself sounding tone deaf, I think that Bitcoin mining is not the most important thing that's happening right now in Kazakhstan. People rioting for their rights is actually a far different thing. It's outside the scope of what Bitcoin really should be right now, right? Energy prices going up, that's a big problem beyond just Bitcoin. Uh, but to your point, the fact that it flowed into Kazakhstan is something that uh, hash rate flowing into Kazakhstan was something that when it first happened, actually worried me a little bit, right? This wasn't exactly the United States, right? The free world. And they did use a lot of coal uh, energy. That's sort of the grid that is in Kazakhstan. The and I, it sounds like I'm shirking the answer to your to your question, but miners just moved from China. They can move somewhere else. And I think they will, right. honestly. Uh, being within the confines of a Kazakhstan regula regulatory environment, if it's even an environment, I don't know very much about it, but it's very different than being the U.S., yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. The, the fact that like there was that flexibility that they had last year could now apply now, right? There's, there's that we did what yep. the one takeaway really in that sense was that. But of course, lots of other factors in play in Bitcoin. We'd have to get into sometime, you know, the Fed's impact, of course, overnight, a really big deal yesterday and, and what that means for the outlook for Bitcoin. So anyway, George, that's all we have time for. So thanks very much for joining us. That was Coindesk Research Analyst George Kaloudis. Uh, you can find the Coindesk Annual Review on our website at coindesk.com backslash research backslash reports. And uh, you can join Coindesk for a special Twitter Spaces event, the Crypto Wars 2022 Battles for Market Dominance. That's tomorrow at 10 a.m. Coming up, the Australian Open goes to the metaverse. But where will the world's number one tennis player be? Christine Lee. It's Zach Seward. I'm Michael Casey. I'm Christy Harkin. I'm Isaiah Jackson. I'm Serena Lynn. Hey, this is Will Foxley. I'm Teresa Santos. Hi, I'm Lawrence Lewiston. Hi, I'm Dorian Wayne. I'm Nikolai Stey. Hi, I'm Kevin Worth. My name is Naomi Brockwell. I'm Jordan Muthra. Hi, I'm Galen Moore. Hi, I'm Brad Cow. I'm Pete Paschal. Hi, I'm Jen Sinassi. You're watching, and you are watching. And you're watching Coindesk TV. Checking in on Bitcoin again, uh, the Coindesk Bitcoin price index XBX is at 42,958. That's down 7.25%. And the Coindesk Indices uh, Ether price index ETX is at 3,393.38, uh, down a whopping 10.79%. And the DeFi index, the Coindesk uh, DFX, is at 452.99, that is down 12.94%. Okay, in the spotlight today, uh, the, sorry. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. All righty, in the spotlight today, the Australian Open tennis star Novak Djokovic and the Metaverse. Australian government authorities yesterday cancelled Djokovic's visa to enter the country. The tennis superstar thought he could play in the games with a medical exemption to get around vaccine requirements, 
But now he's holed up in a quarantine hotel in Melbourne awaiting a court hearing in uh, his fight to overturn the ban on his entry. This must come as somewhat disappointing news to our new guests who are taking this reign open to the metaverse. But it also raises interesting questions about how real-world rules and problems will play out in this strange new digital arena. Joining us to discuss their project is Ridley Plummer, Australian Open Metaverse and NFT Project Manager, and Adam DeCarter of Run It Wild, Blockchain Studio and Metaverse Specialists. Welcome, guys. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having us. Good to have. We've had uh, two. We've had Aussies now twice on the show this week, and so um, I'm feeling like you know this effort that we're making to take over the world is is, uh, is making some progress. So thank you for helping me in my in my crusade to uh, to co- colonize uh, certainly the crypto world. <laughs> Absolutely, um, we'll take guys, over eventually. Eventually, yeah, it's a subtle it's a subtle takeover. T- talk us through what this is all about. What is the user going to experience? through, you know, the metaverse and NFTs and the, and the Aussie Open? Yeah, so the Aussie Open has has been known for a long time as being one of the, the most innovative and forward-thinking Grand Slams or, or sporting events globally. So it was kind of a natural progression for us to, to move into the next space, which we decided was the metaverse. And what we wanted to do was, was create as, as replicable representation of melbourne park as possible so we chose to to jump straight into decentraland and and recreate every element that we could of melbourne park so when someone visits in decentraland they get so many elements and more than they can actually get in at melbourne park so they can see live vision they can see behind the scenes vision they can access areas that they can't otherwise access in real life so we wanted to replicate as much of the on-site experience as possible. And then with the NFTs, we wanted to engage with the tennis community and the NFT community in a way that hadn't been done before. And it was really important for us to create a groundbreaking NFT that no one had done before. And we were using our data and our technology and our abilities to, to bring those together with sport and art to create what we think is a real game changer in the NFT space. Um, thank you so much. That's a good explanation of the overview of what's happening. Can you just, can we just go a little bit deeper though into why you guys are doing this? I mean, are there certain, um, certain features that can only be done in the metaverse that can't be done in real life or, you know, just, just to get like, I mean, obviously it's a very cool project, but are there certain, certain things that you can do here that you couldn't do in the sort of traditional space? Yeah, absolutely. Look, Melbourne Park is is almost built from scratch every year. So there's there's facilities there that exist, but then the rest is built. And we have a creative team that works on that for months and months to bring an amazing experience to the fans that come every year. But what we've found in the last two years is that we're challenged with how many fans can actually come on site now and where they can come from. And, and it's much more of a localised community that comes in. So we kind of wanted to take it back to the world as well and provide those people that can't make it to Melbourne at the moment with an experience that is as close as we can possibly get to bringing them into Melbourne Park and giving them that on-site experience. And as you said, there's there's going to be things that they can do in Decentraland uh, where that might be gamified or they might get access to vision that you can't otherwise see on your free-to-air television or on your... Um, well, on site when you're at the Australian Open. So we wanted to ensure that that people had value when they came in and the event goes for 14 days. So what we do at the event in real life is is try and draw people back day day and day after day. So whether they come on day one with their family and their kids and they explore the the ballpark and, and have fun with the family or, or they come back two days later as a, a couple on date night and have a glass of champagne and dinner at a fancy restaurant, we want to draw people back time and time again, and we need to provide an enormous amount of content to do that in the virtual world. And we're extremely fortunate that we have 50 years of archive footage in in the can to replay to people that they probably haven't seen before. We've also got a huge content team throughout the Australian Open that's producing an enormous amount of content day in, day out that we'll be able to pipe back into Decentraland as well. 
Um, maybe Adam says, you know, you're there presumably like laying out the design of this and how it all works. You can tell us a little bit about what that content looks like though, because I mean, sh- surely you're not, you're not sort of wrapping all the players in live action capture suits and things like that, right? So we're not going to be watching live avatars playing against each other or, or are you? I mean, how, what is the, what is the visual experience here? If you're actually watching live tennis, is it just a video feed and why wouldn't I just go and, you know, watch that on my TV? There's a video feed that's live streaming in, but there's also a whole heap of other content to complement it all. Um, there's obviously gaming, uh, gamified aspects, but there's also a uh, question and conversation around um, Decentraland and other metaverses and virtual world being social platforms that are no different from Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, uh, TikTok, Snapchat. Um, you could say the same thing about all other brands and how they uh, use social um social platforms to connect with different communities. And here um, we've got the Australian Open and their metaverse strategy that's connecting to a crypto native community. So Adam Ridley, I, I mean, we ha- happy new year, first of all, but second of all, uh, you know, as Michael alluded to, uh, Novak Djokovic is not playing or looks like he might not be playing. Does that, if you have a big name, a big draw who won't be able to, or might not be able to, uh, play in the in the actual Australian Open. Does that affect demand for this? I mean, can he do it virtually? Can he play virtually from his hotel his hotel room? And maybe that that could uh, offset some of this. I mean, like, what what do you do in this situation? I mean, how, I, what can change? He, he doesn't need a, a he doesn't need a vaccine in in his hotel. I assume. <laughs> Wait, if Novak wants to join us in Decentraland at any point, he's uh, he's more than welcome. Absolutely. Uh, Look, we're used to situations like this popping up in January. I think we expect the unexpected every year when the Grand Slam comes around and we know there's going to be players that are are injured or unable to attend for one reason or another. Uh, This just happens to be a very unique scenario popping out into play this year. So, I I, I do think it's interesting. Sorry. Sorry. Do you think it... Do you think it does affect, though, the demand for for virtual products, NFTs, and and, and the the uh, virtual experience that that you're trying to provide with this? Look, no, I don't think Novak uh, competing or not competing or or being turned away to go home uh, because he doesn't have the appropriate documentation affects how many people will get to come into Decentraland. I think we've we've done a great job of promoting this to the community, both the crypto community and the tennis community, and we'll continue to do that in the next two weeks leading up to the event. And, uh, yeah, I, I think we're going to see a good good crowd and a good attendance in the event too. I certainly do think it's interesting that, uh, you know, he, he has trouble uh, with the permissioned world of the Australian Open, but the permissionless world of the metaverse may be a different experience. And so interesting to see where all of this goes. Very early days, of course, in the metaverse. Good luck to you both, uh, Ridley and Adam. That was Ridley Plummer and Adam DeCarta. Coming up, Congress plans a hearing on crypto mining. We'll get the latest from Nick Day. Hi, I'm Christine Lee, host of First Mover and all about Bitcoin. You're watching Coindesk TV. Uh, time now to check in with Nick Day, Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. So we have a report that um, Congress is uh, considering hearings into you know, Bitcoin's impact on energy. Um, you know, I think this is related to some of the uh, concerns in certain places around um, you know, Bitcoin mining's impact on energy supplies in various states, but obviously it has all this climate and related issues. Um, what's your take on it? Yeah, so first of all, uh, this report does align with what I've been hearing. It's, you know, that this hearing will be held by the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and it'll probably be somewhere around the uh, end of January, probably in around two weeks, give or take. Um, all that is, you know, yet to be finalized is my understanding, so it could change. But yeah, this is definitely happening. And we've kind of been headed this way for a while, right? 
the current administration has had climate change as a key priority for, you know, a year now since it took office. Uh, Democrats have been concerned about climate change for a while. And crypto has, for better or worse, been linked to concerns about this because of the energy use uh, for proof of work blockchains, including Bitcoin, which is pretty massive. Uh, we've been hearing reports from, you know, various states where, you know, New York is one of the examples being given where coal fa- uh, coal plants are being resurrected to power Bitcoin miners uh, rather than allowed to remain in retirement. So, uh, yeah, this is definitely going to be a, you know, hearing that we'll have to pay attention to because this has been a concern that's been growing. I mean, what what are they what are they gunning at? You know, this is a discussion we had offline earlier. Was um, the U.S. is relatively speaking a clean energy producer? I mean, are, are they trying to drive crypto mining offshore to to countries that will use even more coal and and just more environmentally uh, catastrophic sources of energy? Or are are they going to say, well, at least if we're going to use the energy, might as well use it in a place where we have more renewables than say. Well, I, I don't think we know yet what the you know specific purpose of the hearing is, right? It could be uh, you know anything from uh, last month's hearing from you know from the House Financial Services Committee, where questions were substantive. People felt that there was a solid dialogue from both you know uh, the industry side and the congressional side, or it could be a uh, you know couple hour long. Uh, PR fest, I guess, you know, for lawmakers hoping to get sound bites in uh, rather than ask questions. So we don't know yet what specifically it's going to look like. But also, um, you know, it could be uh, while there are some places in the US that power crypto through renewables, the fact is that there are definitely more than a few power plants that run on coal that, or, you know, other less than clean power sources that have been brought back. And even if they are in a, you know, minority in the US, they are getting headlines, and so it's only natural that Congress is going to want to take a look at that and be, you know, say what's going on here. All righty, we'll see how it all plays out. Thank you, Nick. That was Nick Day, Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation. Don't forget to sign up for Nick's State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. That's it for First Mover. Thank you to my hosts, Lawrence Lewton, Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, and Emily Parker, Managing Director of International Content. I'm Michael Casey, filling in for Christine Lee this week. Meantime, check out The Hash at 12 p.m. Eastern, followed by All About Bitcoin at 3 p.m. You're watching Coindesk TV. Next up, stay tuned for the daily forecast with Angie Lau to see what's happening in crypto Asian markets. Welcome to the Daily Forecast, January 6th, 2022. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. Well, crypto prices were dragged down alongside a sharp fall in global markets after the Fed signaled it may raise rates sooner than expected. We're going to take a look at the market action and a whole lot more coming up. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. First up, riots in Kazakhstan over fuel prices have led to the government resigning and the main telecommunications company, Kazakh Telecom, shutting off internet access nationwide on Wednesday. And that hit the nation's mining sector with data from BTC.com showing that hash rates at mining pools, including Antpool, Poolin and Binance Pool, fell by 10%. However, Chinese rig maker Kanon, which has over 10,000 mining machines deployed in Kazakhstan, told Forecast News its operations remain normal. But the founder of local miner, Sive, tweeted that no internet means no mining. According to the network tracking service NetBlocks, service was partially restored at one point, but blacked out again on Thursday morning. Over in China, add food delivery to the growing list of ways to spend ECNY. Meituan, a Chinese e-shopping platform which has a market share of about 60 to 70 percent in mainland China, is now accepting the digital currency for payments. Now, users must first link their sub wallet to Meituan in the ECNY app, then they can make an order as any other kind of payment, just selecting pay with ECNY. Check out how this ECNY user ordered lunch today.
Around 50 online platforms now accepting digital yuan payments for everything from shopping and transportation to lifestyle and entertainment. This is just one step closer to mass use of the eCNY. You can find those stories and a whole lot more at forecast.news. Well, global markets were sent reeling by a hawkish Fed signaling it may hike rates earlier than anticipated. And crypto was no exception, with most major tokens falling at least 6% into Thursday morning Asia time. And Solana and Terra losing close to 11% within 24 hours. Forecast News' Lachlan Keller has more. Minutes from the Federal Reserve's December meeting suggest that interest rate increases could be brought forward due to the strength of the economy. One expert told Forecast News investors were spooked as that means the easy money environment of the past two to three years may be coming to an end. However, it's not all bad news. The silver lining for me personally is that I think it's actually positive for crypto long term. It essentially says crypto markets aren't this small isolated asset that large investors aren't preoccupied with, but rather it has become something that large funds, large investors Um, are looking at or invested in. More than 800 million US dollars was liquidated from crypto markets in just 24 hours, though that rate appeared to be slowing down Thursday afternoon, Asia time, according to data from Cryptometer. And Danathan says he's cautiously optimistic that the worst of liquidations are now behind us in the short term, with the crash happening in reaction to macro market action rather than market manipulators or whales trying to push prices down. For Forecast News, I'm Lachlan Keller. So what does a brand new year have in store for the new economy? Will we see crypto assets venture into uncharted territory? Or will world events take their toll on digital currencies? In the hot seat, Michael Wu, CEO and founder of Amber Group, joins us once again to answer these questions. Great to see you, Michael. Great to see you, Angie, and happy new year to everyone. Well, Michael, Bitcoin faced a lot of heat in the last month. Some say we could see a sharp decline from these levels, but others like the El Salvadorian president are expecting the coin to hit 100,000 this year. What's your sense? I'm perpetually bullish on Bitcoin and the new digital economy over the long run. Uh, More specifically to this year, I think one thing for sure is we're going to see some volatility. Uh, As you say, the price has been stuck uh, around here for some time. Uh, it's sort of seeking a new direction. Is it going to break a new high uh, above the 60,000 uh, mark or it's it's going to dive lower along with macro factors such as, uh, you know, the potential, the tapering, um, uh, the, 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 the back to normal, hopefully, um, and, uh, you know, um, the, the inflation that we are dealing with. Uh, so uh, I think uh, volatility is actually not a bad thing uh, for the market at all, uh, as long as risks are properly managed. Um, I, I do think you know if we do see some uh, some volatility in the crypto asset early on this year, that might set it up uh, well for another big bull run uh, in the later half of the year. And so if that's the situation as you see it, it could mean that 2022 could be the year of mass market adoption of crypto products. I mean, we've heard from NYDIG, which recently raised over a billion US dollars. They expect a thousand banks and retailers to sell crypto related products through them. And these these are kind of pretty big numbers. Do you think we're going to see massive mainstream adoption for this year? I do think uh, crypto is going beyond that just this niche uh, uh, user base of uh, uh, traders, speculators or engineers. Uh, I think uh, with products like Wealthing, which we uh, launched at the end of uh, 2021, uh, are, are targeting to uh, make crypto or crypto enabled financial services more inc- inclusive to the mass market users so that you know without uh, too much knowledge, uh, without being too sophisticated at crypto or finance, they can still enjoy the long-term benefits of the asset and of the technology. Um, in the institutional land, uh, I think we have seen a lot of ongoing uh, adoption since mid-2020. Uh, I don't think that trend will stop or, or, or reverse at all. Well, before we let you go, very quickly, Fed is unwinding and it's been discussed extensively. Do you think that this macro event is going to really extend what we're going to see in 2022? Uh, I certainly think it will play a major impact on uh, all asset classes, including crypto. If you look at uh, uh, the the old gold, 
before the digital gold. Uh, uh, gold prices has been sideways for a year. Um, Bitcoin prices has completely decoupled uh, from gold prices. Now, if Fed does start to uh, uh, taper and uh, uh, there's a, a, a interest rate normalization expectation, um, I, I, I think you know there could be again you know an, an initial convergence of the two assets, and then uh, over time, of course, uh, you know if volatility does increase. I think you know. Um, actually, Bitcoin potentially uh, uh, can act more like a, a, a risk haven assets again, similar to gold. Versus right now, as it stands, it probably trades more like a a, a risk asset that uh, correlates more with equities and the like. Well, safety haven or risk, whatever it is, it is shaping up to be one interesting year ahead for the new economy. Michael, thanks a lot. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until the next time.